Welcome to another Pioneer live stream. We are very, very excited to have one, to have everyone with us today. If this is your first time checking out a Pioneer live stream, thank you so much for um, tuning in. We hope to make this interesting and, uh, and exciting for you. Uh, we'll, we'll kind of describe uh, the regimen of the day in a moment, but uh, if you have absolutely no clue what Pioneer is, I mean, I guess the best way to go figure that out is, is the website. I, uh, I, I won't bother pitching it here. The, the um, Pixels, images, lights, and sounds uh, you may see on the website at pioneer.app will do you a favor. But the high level gist is that uh, we're trying to build a kind of sense of place on the internet, almost a, a city on the web for people who are taking the first steps uh, in working on a project that might turn into a company. Pioneer is, is really meant to be a kind of motivational engine or treadmill, so to speak. Um, to really help, uh, you know, create the next, you know, 1,000 or 10,000 uh, great companies or founders. And today we're going to take a peek at the kind of final product of Pioneer. Uh, folks who've done really well in our online tournament and, and indeed have, have kind of won it and become Pioneers. And they will be kind of, they'll describe their project briefly and then they'll be interviewed uh, by some um, very interesting hosts who will kind of ask them some questions about their product or, or their app. And so we're very thankful to have here today three uh, extremely esteemed uh, individuals, um, Mamoon Hamid from Kleiner Perkins, Nabil Hyatt uh, from Spark Capital, and Luciana from Sequoia. They'll be interviewing pioneers uh, and kind of uh, having them go back and forth describing their projects. And we're hopeful this kind of creates a, a bit more of an interesting uh, a dialogue than just having everyone present the entire time. We're going to bring on our first guest for today, um, Hannah uh, from uh, Toronto, Canada, and she'll be uh, presenting Send. Uh, a kind of Bloomberg for, for real estate. Uh, so Hannah, take it away whenever you're ready. Great. So hi, everyone. My name is Hannah. I'm the founder of Ascend from Toronto, and we're building a one-stop shop for real-time rental real estate insights. There are more than 100 billion square feet of properties being leased every single year, but we've learned that there's still no good way to price them. After talking to more than 200 real estate analysts at 67 real estate development firms, we've learned that analysts are spending 400 hours per year manually going through sites like Craigslist, Kijiji to create this huge 300 line Excel sheet comparables. And because the process is so time consuming, there's always a two to three months data lag, which then leads to inaccurate pricing and can result in millions of dollars lost in revenue. So that's why we come in. Even though we've only been building a cent for the past month and a half, we've already um, got $14,400 in uh, revenue. We've also been working with three different real estate development firms over four different cities and have helped them price out more than 1,400 rental homes. Our revenue model is that we charge real estate development firms an annual subscription of 6,600 per seat per year. So some example company you can think of is CBRE that can have anywhere from you know, hundreds to thousands of real estate analysts. So now let's walk through a um, real demo of how Sun actually works. We'll build our own API to scream, uh, stream data from popular networks like Rex and Sokotichi. And then instead of having to comb through them, you can actually export everything in one click. Um, something that was actually not possible before was that we archive inactive listings. So then now a real estate developer could answer a question like, if I want to rent out a townhouse um, and I want it to go off market in one day, what price exactly should I put it at? We also give people a comprehensive view of all their competitors in the market with the other building products. And finally, um, this is customer's favorite feature, which is you're able to customize and generate a real-time graph of dynamic pricing and how pricing is fluctuating in the market. We are currently looking for an advisor with deep experience in real estate development, acquisition, and leasing to help us further build out our product. Um, and that's all. Awesome. Real estate tech has been interesting and popular as an investment category for the last decade or so. And it's mm -hmm. probably because uh, there's just a lot of big buyers of software or data, really. And right. um, could you so talk about some of the competitors that like, you know, right. in the past I've come across companies like Hightower and BTS and that provide data uh, for some of the same sort of buyers that you're targeting? Yeah, sure. So currently we're operating in Canada and focusing on that market right now. And we've heard that there are two main competitors. Uh, one is Urban Analytics um, and the second is CoStar. So CoStar is like a billion dollar company. And basically the way, and customers don't like them. Uh, one of the reasons being is that um, CoStar has like 1400 analysts cold calling property managers, real estate developers. And because of that factor, it's, there's still like a data lag um, problem that customers are experiencing. Because if you think about it, a really hot pricing, which is go off market in six hours, right? So um, that component of real-time dynamic live pricing is what customers are attracted to us for. 
Yeah. Yeah, I know. I've heard about CoStar for the last decade or so. And <laughs> it sounds like one of those companies that uh, all tech founders want to displace, replace because they're just kind of old school and they like literally <laughs> call people. Right. Um, right. And um, and especially like in San Francisco, rents have been plummeting. I mean, when, are they calling people now or are they calling, did they call them six months ago? So um it, but it seems like CoStar has um, a, a really good grip on this market. Um, is it because of their sales channels? Is it because of their relationships with the buyers? Um, and even though they may dislike them, they may have just really good sales. And uh, how do you address that component? Yeah, so I think um, one of the um, strategies that we're implementing is that, you know, the CoStar essentially has, you know, a very strong sales team, like thousands of people just manually cold calling. Um, but then the data is still imperfect. So we're hoping to overcome that by even having property managers themselves and risk developers um, kind of like uploading data live to the site to see other people's insights. So if you know about Classdoor, like you upload, you can just see other people's salary on Classdoor. You have to upload your own data to see other people's salary. So we're kind of like experimenting with like a similar model where um, you can do that. And hopefully the more users we have and we're able to build that large database on our site. And hopefully that will convince um, customers that we have a very reliable and big database. So you you want to be faster, better, and cheaper, like the trifecta. Yes, um, and do it at scale as well. Right, and uh, and you mentioned you're initially going after the, uh, the Canadian market? Yes, we're currently going after the Canadian market because we think that um, there are less there's less comp competition there and there are less solutions there and the market's super underserved. And another reason is actually um, a lot of cities now uh, because there are so many houses, house pricing going up, the governments themselves actually implemented a policy that says, you know, in British Columbia, if you want to build a tower that's higher, like 50 stories, you need to include purpose-built rental unit in there. And then you can, you're able to like create more density. So we're focusing on cities that have the sort of incentives where developers are continuously adding more and more rentals into their, um, their, yeah. To their yeah. And you also have this like give to get, so you, you give so you can get, right? Uh, yeah. And um, and with that, you're building a proprietary data set. Uh, and, um, you know, you have to work a lot to get that proprietary data set. And um, there's, you know, once you have more data than others, it becomes more valuable. And you, again, it's a, then it's proprietary. So what, how are you fostering that uh, give to get? Um, sure, like you're getting something, but like right now, there's not much to get. So how, are, how are you, that, that virtuous cycle, how do you get out of the catch 22 and into the virtual cycle? Yeah, I think that's a that's a great question. So the way that we're implementing it right now is that even though you know these sites like Craigslist, whatever, they have um, the asking rents. What people really really care about is the lease rents, and nobody really has that right now. Especially when you go dig really deep into you know lockers, like how much locker is renting for, or how much you know parkings are renting for. Nobody has that leased rent data. So the way we do it is we um, very manual taking data from you know developers we have built relationships with in the area and then say that hey if you upload your leased data and we verified it with like a leasing agreement then you're able to see this aggregated view of similar developers within that sub market but if you don't give it to us then oh well that's uh too bad for you <laughs> right so it's a unique feature that people have to give cool thank you hannah it's awesome great thank hannah. you thank you too thank you so much mamoon thank you for the studious questions um uh, next up, uh, we're going to bring up uh, Nacho and Jerry from Mexico. They'll be presenting uh, Money Pool, which is a, a kind of Venmo, um, but for L Latin America, um, a market, I guess, that has significantly different banking dynamics than, than our trusted United States. Before they get started, one interesting tidbit for people that are about to close this browser tab or Zoom webinar is we do have a cool product uh, demo uh, or beta that we're going to launch at the end of this. So, so you may want to stay tuned for that. With that, um, I'll let the MoneyPools take it away. Go ahead. I'm Nacho Alvarez. I'm co-founder and CEO of MoneyPool. MoneyPool is Venmo for Latin America. We realized that collecting money from the people we know sucks. Uh, you end up spending too much time sending reminders on the phone, emails, text messages, and then trying to keep track of payments through mental accounting and all that stuff. And it's just time consuming and it's exhausting and nobody wants to do it. So. We built Moneypool to help people pull money with their friends and communities for any shared expense. 
And we're doing this through a group collection strategy because it has a threefold benefit. First of all, the many to one collection, it's regarded as a high pain point and something that is worthy of looking for a solution. Also, it has an embedded virality to it because we are acquiring users by the bulk by bringing group of friends. And we're building social proof in a market that's yet to build trust in online payments. And we had the traction to back this up. In the last three years, active users have grown 4X and without any investment in acquisition. That's because the dynamic is that every organic user is bringing five invited users to the platform. And revenues are following and even growing faster. In the same period, revenues have grown 5X. It's very easy to start collecting money. You just have to name your pool, invite friends, and start receiving payments. Money is held by the money pool until you decide to withdraw it to any bank account. So now we're building the next step, which is the money pool store. It's a place where people are gonna be able to use the money that they have pulled to pay for utility bills, buy from stores, or find and pay local businesses in their network. We are raising our pre-series A round for a 500K in order to increase revenue for X in the next six months. Thank well, you. Awesome. Uh, sounds awesome. And uh, you're in Mexico today? Is that yeah. gotcha? So, are you creating a separate wallet uh, where you know you actually hold on to people's money that is connected yeah. to their bank account, so they load their wallet from their bank account? Okay, that's it. That's it. On the back end, how do you transfer money around? Is it uh, there's various ways of doing it, but curious how you do it. So, the money incoming comes from debit and credit cards, and we use a payments processor, uh, and then money going out, we connect to the banking system to do it like wire transfers. Uh, everything else is the front end with the user that's built by us. And what qualifies as revenue for you? That, that revenue number, what is that? Um, is it fees? Yes. So it's fees and interest on balance because we hold the balance and we're generating something uh, for us. Right, right. And I don't know, what are interest rates in Mexico like? Because there's zero over here. <laughs> well, it, it has been dropping for the last year, but it's about 4%. Okay. Uh, that, that is not actually like the, the money-making feature of this. It, it's interesting because it, it's, it's gross margin. It doesn't have any additional cost uh, link to it. Uh, but that's why we're building the money pool store because we know that people are pulling money, holding the money there, and then taking it out to use it somewhere else. So now we're going to bring that in the platform so they can do it uh, inside. And we're going to take a cut of that as well, as well. Yeah. What's the average balance for uh, one of your active users? $50. They've got that money sitting there, um, and but do you want too much money sitting there? Because right now you can only send it to your friends, right? And it's not you can't use it to pay stuff, pay for stuff. Yeah, not yet. Uh, but I, I would like to say that it's fifty dollars per user. But once money is pulled, you're pulling about two hundred and fifty because five friends get together, and so that increases significantly the the amount of help. Yeah, uh, this might be a really dumb question, but uh, there's no Venmo or PayPal. There is no Venmo, there is PayPal, but uh, the functionality, I think something similar that in the US happened that it just falls short in addressing this kind of uh, transaction. I mean, it's peer to peer, but it's uh, fall, falls short of the quick, the, the, the rapid money transfer. The, the, the social aspect to it. Uh, yeah, right. Um, and then uh, can you talk about some of the areas, uh, like you, you talked about your, you'll have the paying your bills and uh, paying for vendors, where you are with that, and if you make money off of those vendor relationships as well from the businesses. Yes, we, we do. Uh, and there's three sections that I talked about. One of them is like just paying utility bills. And what we're looking at is that uh, we have a lot of roommates that are splitting bills for electric and then just withdrawing and then paying. So we're just going to bring that inside the platform and we, we can make a, a fee from that, uh, from that service. And also from the, the store, which is just buying from actual stores, uh, it varies. Some of them uh, can give us like somewhere between three and ten percent uh, of the sale. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how regulations work in Mexico, but are there regulatory hurdles for you around uh, money transfer? Yes, it's uh, there's regulatory hurdles in holding people's money, and this is something that's new. This is a fintech law that passed last year, and we are in that process of getting approved. Uh, and everything's it's going well. We're complying with everything, so there's no. I guess you're already holding on to money, so you you must have the approval to hold on to money today. 
Yeah, so the, there's some nuances to how the law was drafted, but if you were already doing it by a certain date, you were allowed to keep doing it. So that's where we are. Uh, but it's just asked for in parallel to ask for the permission and just filling out the forms. Gotcha. And uh, how are you driving your zero dollar CAC growth? So it's just the, uh, the the traffic that comes into it. Since it's it's a multiplayer game, you have to bring friends. If Mamoon bring and comes in for a barbecue, he's gonna bring five friends that are gonna learn about Moneypool, how it's used, and what they can use it for. So either them become another group collector, or they can recommend it for a, a use case. So that's just bringing a, a natural growth to it. Cool. I'm curious, um, what's the split between iOS and Android? It's more uh, as the, towards iOS. I think that has to do with the way it started, like the first user that we got because it grows organically. It's just like people that uh, have iOS devices are more like community, like they're closer. So like they just keep inviting more iOS users. Cool. Thank you, Nacho. Thank you, Mamon. Thank you, Mamoon, again. And last but not least, in the uh, Mamoon Hamid segment, uh, in, 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 that cor- in this corner uh, of, our, uh, of our restaurant, we have Sid presenting from California, and he'll be presenting uh, Prefix, which is a, a no-code kind of browser RPA solution um, targeted, I think, at an interesting section of the market that has not quite been exploited by um, you know, UiPath, Retool, et al. All right, take it away whenever you're ready, Sid. So hi everyone, I'm Sid, I'm building Prefix and Prefix is a tool that lets folks automate complex workflows on the internet very quickly. So like I just said, Prefix is meant to be a very easy, very fast tool to be to use and it's meant to be able to approach some uniquely complex workflows on the internet and it's best explained visually. So I'll jump right into some demos. So any automation in Prefix starts with telling Prefix which buttons to click on the internet and which fields to fill. So in this, toy automation I'm doing to kind of scrape LinkedIn for some mutuals I have with a friend. I am labeling the email, password, and sign-in fields and button uh, on the right side and uh, a, side, a sidebar that's kind of bundled into the Chrome extension we provide and telling prefix where to go on the internet. The next step to building automations is kind of to create a process diagram. And traditionally this has been done in sequences, but instead we allow users to embed some business logic into these automations which kind of increases the number of use cases we can service. And so what we're doing here is dragging blocks like open URL, fill field, and click button around. Prefix sits between what has historically been a very large ecosystem of automation products, uh, developer products, and Chrome extensions, uh, and some very, very complicated RPA tools that are meant for services firms. And I think that like, if you create a product in the middle, it offers the accessibility and modern tool set of the left side of this, as well as offers some of the more complexity and nuance of the right side, uh, we're able to allow end users to automate their own workflows. So Prefix focuses on the web, and this has a lot of advantages, but the main one is there's a huge base of applications we can target, and this increases kind of the probability of finding an initial niche of users uh, on a specific tool. I'm hoping to automate areas in financial services first. I have some experience in automation there, um, and I've been working on Prefix so far. Uh, so as you just saw, we have the desktop client and a, a browser extension built already. And there's kind of a synergy between those that allows end users to automate things quickly. Uh, we have a pilot program at Stanford or automating Oracle BI and some trials launching with retail customers uh, this month. The next steps are to release a server product. So folks don't need to keep uh, opening their laptop and like running this stuff uh, locally. Uh, zero in on some very specific tools and scale to users of those tools and then hit uh, roughly five figures ARR by spring. Thank you for listening. Awesome. Um, really whizzy. Y- you mentioned um, financial services because you have some experience there. And it, it, that happens to be also uh, an area where Automation Anywhere, UiPath uh, really have done well because they those companies use a lot of um, s- services that help them automate things. And uh, do you... F- think that you'll end up competing head to head with them uh, if you're going out to financial services? I think down the road, it's very likely, but right now um, the firms we're approaching are firms that can't uh, like resource automation teams that can put in like the time to understand these tools. And they have actually like a Stanford, for example, is sitting on like some licenses of UiPath, but like no one's using them because they're just, they take a lot of effort to understand. Mm -hmm. Because they require external consultants to come in and help uh, set up. Yeah. And here the analysts themselves can do the work uh, and set up these automations. Mm-hmm. 
I do like kind of an onboarding with some of the more technical folks on the team and they can kind of spread the word from there. Yeah, in, in enterprise, it's, there's always the, like, do you go the bottoms up adoption or do you go, you know, build a product that you sell for six figures and you go top down? And it, it seems like even though you can, you've got a product that can straddle both the both sides of it, the you, your intent is going after sort of the, the enterprise market still. Yeah, yeah. As we build out more features, I think that's a closer fit to enterprise. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's okay. There's a lot of really great companies that are worth a lot of money um, that end up being enterprise companies and more likely and not more successful actually. Uh, so yeah, I would just say this, if you're gonna choose that market, you're gonna choose it and build the features for them. And uh, usually that requires um, capital <laughs> to build those features. So uh, I'm sure there's some capital raising um, in your future as well. What's, uh, what's customer feedback in terms of like features they need, want uh, that, you, 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 that are at the top of your list right now? A lot of it is kind of very case specific stuff. For example, if kind of uh, one of the things we need to really hammer out that still it's, it's, I've been wrestling with it for a while is kind of clicking buttons inside of iframes. And there's some like two factor authentication um, things that happen at the beginning of most workflows that have these very complex elements and we need to be able to access those. But a cool thing is that um, even if customers are having trouble um, use like following one path uh, on the workflow, they're often able to identify like other drill downs and other ways of making that thing happen on the web. Yeah, What's, what are your next few hires? I'm thinking uh, mostly focused on customer development. Uh, for a lot of tools in this space, I think uh, there's something that like automates stuff just for the web, but like there's no focus on like drilling down into a specific couple of niches. So if I can have uh, folks who have experience in customer development and sales on this early on, um, look through a bunch of tools in a specific area like financial services and see which ones we can scale along. That would be ideal. Thank you so much, Sid. Um, Mamoon, thank you so much. Nabil, it's great to see you again. Thanks for coming by. We're going to have um, a couple of interesting companies present by you and I'm very, very curious to, to obviously get your takes on them. I am excited to present to you um, your first pioneer company today, Autobahn AI. They're building uh, a fully automated um Great tripping truck, you know, fairly similar to what Uber and Embark is doing. And they have a um, bit of an interesting take on it, You kind of your typical hacker take on it. Uh, Kristen, whenever you're ready, take it away. All right. Uh, hi, my name is Christian Gebbes. I'm the CEO uh, and, and founder of Audubon AI, and we're automating the entire freight shipping process. So driverless trucks have been on the horizon for the last 10 years, but realistically, how long before most routes are actually supported? No driver also means no paper docs, and no phone calls, yet 75% of shipments are still dispatched non-electronically. Without updated infrastructure, how will a driverless truck even know where to go, who to update, or how to confirm pallet count and a trailer seal? We're solving this by manufacturing bolt-on autonomy kits that streamline the unsexy tasks for in trucking for drivers, dispatchers, shippers, and receivers. Our goal is to automate the entire freight shipping process with semi-autonomy for semi-trucks and semi-trailers. We're already incorporating feedback from prospective paying customers and pioneering a next-gen operating system for trucking. We call it Delivery OS. The process starts by creating a smart delivery. All that is needed is a destination, pallet count, and a desired temperature setting. The order then gets auto-dispatched to the vehicle, which uses computer vision to streamline those tedious delivery tasks provided that at least hardware version one or higher is installed. The delivery can then be tracked and viewed with all the information and evidence in one single place. In particular, you can review events all the way down to the level of a single pallet getting loaded on the trailer. We charge a $200 fee per delivery and believe we can process about 1 million smart orders within four years. We've built mission control before, but it's just on a slightly smaller scale. Um, it was so out of this world that uh, we won second place at NASA doing so. What we need now is 350,000 to support the launch of our 15 truck trailer pilot in early Q1, uh, which will allow us to grow our revenue to about $30,000 a month later this year. We just closed on 200,000. And with that said, I'd love to open it up for any questions. Thank you. It's good to see this and, and let's get into it. Cruise was founded in something like 2013. We're, we're quite a ways into the market now. And so as crazy as autonomous is, um, there's a lot of competitors. Uh, and, and so talk a little bit about what they've got wrong and, and what kind of a different approach you're taking. We largely see the, the, the autonomous problem um, as one that uh, really is gonna require 
um, mass scale fleet learning, uh, at least uh, to adopt it at a global uh, level. Um, to validate such a system, uh, you know, running simulations, I think is, you know, that's absolutely needed in one thing, right? But you need to be able to validate across like all roads um, and all different types of circumstances, right? So I think that the approach by a lot of companies that's been taken is let's build our own fleet, let's buy every single car, you know, as an asset, whatever on our balance sheet, um, and let's drive a, s a specific restricted area, uh, map it, and just keep ro running, running, running until we can, uh, until we can ship. And so uh, we're taking a different approach from that perspective, where obviously we can't build a vehicle. Um, we also don't want to own a vehicle because the amount of vehicles that we need for the amount of data to uh, that's needed. Um, is like $10 billion, um, about 50,000 trucks or something like this. So we're taking the aftermarket approach um, by bolting on an app, uh, basically a, a retrofit kit. And um, that has much lower safety requirements than, a, for example, a driverless truck, right? So um, this is a system that augments the driver. Um, and initially it's a lot of passive um, tasks that are automated, um, but there's a huge driver shortage and we just wanna make it easier. Um, to, perform, to perform that job while kind of exploiting the fact that we're, you know, we have hardware on a lot of vehicles. So is the idea that the driver's still in the truck, um, but maybe you're taking over during the sleep cycle on a long haul or, 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 uh, or what are the tasks that is taking over? Yeah, definitely keeping the driver in the picture. Um, that, that's, that's for sure uh, where we're, where we're focusing. And then, you know, uh, long-term, uh, you know, absolutely like, you know, evol this evolving um, into something bigger was, would definitely be like, a, you know, sleep mode on autopilot, basically, something like that, right? But that's, that requires even a, kind of an, another generation of hardware, um, more safety, rigorous, you know, testing and requirements, so. Yeah, and then um, how do you expand to, plan to go into the market? Do you want, you said you don't want to build a full fleet. Is the idea that you're selling this aftermarket um, as an add-on bolt-on to somebody's small fleet? in trucking, which at least the benefit is like there's a bunch of small trucking fleets to sell into, right? Yeah, sure. So I, I, uh, this perhaps might be the most unique thing about uh, how we are kind of trying to innovate on the business model here. Um, so instead of just upfront selling um, this hardware to a trucking company, we say, um, well, when there is no driver in the vehicle, um, it's going to have to somehow work very closely in terms of integration with the shipper. Um, and these are two separate parties. Um, that right now there's like a break in the link in the supply chain between these two, right? So what we say is if, if, if you bring a shipper with you, um, we'll actually give you this hardware. We'll only do this for the first couple uh, carriers, but we'll give you the hardware actually at no upfront cost um, and this essentially subsidize that cost um, for you um, basically to kind of create this initial network effect um, uh, for us where we, you know, through the every delivery that we make money on, we, we, we repay that cost. Um, so as far as I'm aware, I I'm not sure there's another company that can um, uh, ba basically deploy this large of a fleet or have an ability to deploy this large of a fleet. Um, oh, so if I'm hearing that right, you know, it's this combination of an autonomy stack, which we won't have the time to kind of go through the technology sure. stack a whole bunch here, but there's this combination of autonomy with, with like SaaS integration software in a way. Like part of what you're offering is that it's more directly integrated into fleet management and the supply side. Yeah, uh, exactly. So um, the, yeah, the, the entire delivery process, like it, it's incredibly mundane or tedious, a um, lot of phone calls, emails, um, and there's just a lot of human, throughout this process, there's just a lot of human errors. So we see that that's a perfect place to start providing value. Um, and, and we actually see that uh, for a particular type of um, customer set in the market, uh, like high value loads, um, this is actually like extremely attractive and has been mainly our driving force for, for product. So yeah, la last question for me is actually, I, I would be exactly about these customers. Like have you, what's the target segment you think would be, um, perfect for this approach and who are you going after to be your first four or five pilots? Yeah, sure. So uh, we are uh, surely preparing uh, and, and hoping we can uh, provide a, a layer of additional security, for example, for uh, COVID vaccine distribution, um, but particularly, you know, even more broadly, like pharma medical um, is where, where we see, you know, temperature setting requirements or temperature validation of every pallet um, is uh, particularly something that they'd be willing to pay for. Well, good luck. Thanks so much.
Thank you very much. Next up, um, we have Calvin and TJ, uh, who are presenting from Nigeria. They'll be presenting uh, Sales Cabal, which is uh, Shopify for Africa. I am going to let uh, Calvin and TJ uh, take it away. So my name is Calvin Umechuku, um, representing Sales Cabal. We call ourselves the Shopify for Africa. So with an increase in mobile penetration, internet penetration, and also exploding population right now in Africa, the big question we sought to ask ourselves is what is the future of commerce you know, in Africa and definitely how can we enable it? So one, one thing that we really understand right now is that the future of commerce will be mainly mobile, would be off online, but as well offline and definitely conversational. So what we did at Sales Cabal is to provide a mobile inventory management tool that provides SMEs or small businesses with an easy way to sell online and offline via website or social media to manage their inventory, sales and customers and track everything. So track their orders, even the ones that come in online in their brick and mortar shops, their transactions and also their business performance all through a single app, which also gives them access to e-payments, delivery and also access and they can also access loan or, or credit. Now, this is what the product looks like. So because we know almost everyone uses mobile, uh, this is what a, a simple merchant store looks like. And this is what the merchant app looks like. So it gives them the to-do, they can check their orders, add the other products and see a simple friendly analytics of their business. We sort of put up a launch um, earlier this year and we have currently over 1300 stores selling over $2 million inventory size to 8,500 shoppers. And over time, we want to be able to add complementary products and integrations that we feel that the merchants will need, especially in Africa, following and tailored to our space and definitely go for strategic partnerships with trade power players so right now we know that the African Continental Free Trade Agreement is, is, or has already been signed and we want to see how we can power trade across Africa over the next 18 months. So we're raising 300K to support over 50,000 businesses across two countries in Africa over the next 18 months. We've, we've sealed 50K from a, a, an internet provider here in, in Nigeria uh, on West Africa. Thank you. Excellent. And, uh, and congrats on the progress on the pilot launch. That, that's awesome. Um, awesome. Thank you, you very much, Navi. Yeah. For, for those who don't you know, know uh, the African market as well, is there, is there no, nothing like Shopify in Africa or sales and element? If I'm trying to build a store online, what would I go use right now? Yes. Yeah, so normally you would have to, get, you would have to um, hire a developer that would help you do it. And, that, and truly that's what we started with doing, uh, myself and TJ, who is on the call yep. also. In 2018, what we did was to build websites for a lot of people. And because of the increase that we started seeing in demand, we, we started thinking, how do we automate all these things? You know, how can we productize it? If, instead of trying to build the same thing for different people. And we know that that is actually really expensive to start set up. It's complex and technical because they would have to ask us to add it, to change something on their website or to, it is something, but right now on their app, a simple and easy to use app, they can actually edit everything on their on their website and also on their offline stores, just with a, with a sim single app. Uh, you mentioned uh, loans in there a little bit, like on top of all of this, there, there might be some, some money lending. Is that live yet? Yeah, so how, how we're thinking about it is, um, so Sales Cabal is like a platform and we help other, other providers connect through through to the merchants with our platform. So one thing that we're doing right now is um, payments. So right now, companies like Flutterwave can connect on our platform and merchants can use Flutterwave to pay for their, to pay for their products on their stores. You know, we have delivery services that are connected. Um, and so we have, we're already in talks with a bank that will, that will want to provide loans to merchants. And they would also provide that because definitely they need merchants. And because of the fact that they can see all the records, all the business transactions and the performance over time, definitely they can, you know, they would definitely want to um, for, give out that loans because they can, it's trackable. Because most of, most of the time right now in Africa, a lot of things cannot be tracked, and which is the, the key thing that we're trying to do right now. Yeah, that, that's why I asked. It seemed potentially very valuable for you all. But, but, the, the, but the concept for you all would not be that you want to build out a lending as a part of the business. It's more like no. you're going to use that data to enable other people to come in. Exactly. Exactly, Nabil. 
that is what we want to do. We want to put it as a platform and we would have delivery services. Right now we already have delivery services. We have e-payment um, on the platform and we're adding a lot more um, and we're, we're getting credits and loans right now. Another thing we also have is connecting yourself, connecting to the Facebook shop, IG shop, um, you know, um, Pixel for analytics. You can connect to your Facebook Pixel. So all these things you can, a, a simple, a, another merchant that has not the, no idea of how to even use a computer or even has no laptop, you know, can access all these things, all these tools easily with just that simple, sim, simple app. Uh, uh, last question for me is it like, what did you learn during the pilot? What surprised you? Hmm. Okay, one key thing that surprised us is, so because of the fact that we started the business with building, building um, customized websites for everyone, um, we noticed that was definitely drawing us back because of the time it takes to build a different customized website for, for each merchant. What we noticed that is that not every, they don't necessarily care about it, at least in this market. We don't necessarily care about all the nice branding, you know. People want their own websites, yes, that they can control and they have access to and they can say, hey, take my link. It is www.nabil.com and it'll take you to a website and you can basically purchase any of my items from that website. That is the most important thing that we've seen. We give them a little bit of a way to customize, but I think the most important thing is that we, we've learned that it is actually super easy to build for to build for our market if you actually understand the market and that is what we've been doing over the past six months and hopefully would would we're excited to see where we'll get to get to in the over the next 18 months across africa yeah okay wait no i said that was my last question but now i'm i'm he, I'm, I'm bringing another one up kelvin <laughs> so okay, Daniel, no give me one second. yes <laughs> which is which is that you you if it's true that it turns out that customization was maybe less of a priority for people than you thought does yeah. that maybe make you think that it should be closer to Amazon and not and not Shopify? That maybe they don't need their own stores, but you can have a unified interface. Yeah. So one, one thing about one thing about the the unified interface is that people don't own it. Yes. Yeah. Your customers aren't yours. Um, your customers aren't yours. You don't. You you can't. You don't have the leeway to customize your own domain name or brand it the way you would want. Definitely the customization there is that they actually want customization, but not that far, you know, not that, oh, I want this lady dangling on, on that website. No, I want to come in to get my products and go. That is the most important thing. And, we, and that is what we are enabling. And we want to be able to enable much more businesses across Africa to do that same, same thing of um, getting, engaging their users, selling their products and definitely making more money. Got it. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much. Thank Good you luck. so much, Navia. Take care. Always happy to have uh, one extra uh, helping of questions. So uh, insofar as much as we thought that was kind of peak uh, awesome energy, um, uh, I actually think you'll really enjoy this next cohort of founders. So next up, I, I think Zach is going to be the lead here, but he'll be really present representing Zach uh, himself and Dakota and Harrison from Alabama. Uh, and they'll be presenting uh, Remora Robotics, which is kind of a, a Roomba um, but for the ocean uh, and for lakes, uh, products being sold to, to really help clean up, um, I think, in general, local um, municipalities' waters and then maybe globally expand to something more exciting. Anyway, Zach, I'm sorry if I mis mispitched your company, but please take it away. Great name, by the way. Thank you. It took us, it took us a while. At first, it was called <laughs> like a dolphin, and then we are like, that doesn't make sense. Hey, I'm Zach. I'm co-founder and CEO of Remora Robotics. I'm here today with my co-founder, Harrison. And basically, there's going to be more plastic waste than fish in the ocean by 2050 if we don't do something about it. That's about one dump chunk of trash every single minute. And over 90% of this waste is coming from city waterways before it gets to the ocean. As you'd imagine, this is causing a lot of damages worldwide, not only to our cities and our oceans, but as well as just like basic tourism at small beach towns. So these are like the current methods to do, like take care of the problem. Uh, you got floating trash cans, giant machinery, floating booms that are kind of static, and guys with nets. So we set out to solve the problem. Um, we made this, the Remora. The Remora is an autonomous drone boat that cleans waste from waterways. Picture kind of like a Roomba, but on water. Its concept of operations are basically it starts in its docking station, then it goes out on a predetermined path. When it's on this path, if it identifies waste, it'll go grab the waste, get back on the path. And then once it's full or it needs to recharge, it'll go to its docking station and do that. And then it'll go back out and do it all over again. So here's a little product that we made for you guys. 
basically the video on the right is showing you like how much you can carry at one time. Well, my favorite one on the, is the bottom middle. Um, basically this is a difficult maneuver. It's shallow, there's weeds. It's got to like back up and close its door at the same time. And yeah. So our target market is marinas, harbors, ports, and cities. Um, we will be targeting cities though, mainly just because again, this is where like the majority of waste is coming from worldwide. So we're actually starting city trials next week, first with Melbourne, Florida. Then we'll be traveling to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Hopefully long-term we're, we're going to try to expand all the way to Southeast Asia because this is where like the majority of waste really is coming from. Uh, we've got a team of four aerospace engineers with research backgrounds in waterways, drones, and materials. Yeah, that's it. Great. Um, so I don't, I, I can obviously visualize and understand the problem. Um, I'm not sure I understand the customer. So can you talk about who, like who's buying those trash cans? Yeah, definitely. So right now, Seabin sold around 800 of them in under like five years, mainly to marinas and ports. I think like 4Ocean and some other like giant machinery is being more sold to cities currently. And then how do you think about the process for selling into a city? Right. So that's kind of like a long sales window. So that's yeah. also why we will be selling to B2B markets like um, ports and harbors and stuff or and marinas. Um, yeah. I mean, like right now, like the process really is just like a lot of cold calling and like going up the chain. We can actually go up the chain faster than you think. We've, we've just been invited to like city council meetings and stuff like that. So. And your pitch with them is, are they already in process where they're trying to buy, you know, a non-autonomous version? And then you're like, no, 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 don't do that. Do this instead. Or are you actually like pitching the, pro the product for the first time and the thought process for the first time? Your marinas are terrible. We got photos of it. Uh, you know, go clean it up. Yeah. So like a lot of like the larger marinas do like it just for like the, it makes their marina seem more like advanced to the competitors and stuff. But in the B2G market, um, for example, Baton Rouge, they're, Apparently they've got a lot of trash all over their waterways and they're like renovating and stuff in the next year. So they're like, Hey, we need someone to help like clean this all up and like do it long-term. And we're like, okay, so we're going to go down there and do that. Florida, it was just like, they apparently just have a lot of trash in their rivers and lakes and stuff. And so, yeah, we'll find out next week. Yeah. It feels like a, a very good autonomous problem because it's such a controlled uh, environment. And yeah. Go, go for it. Looking for like bad things. Thank you. But I, but I do care. I'm curious about, capacity like it seems like a good easy computer vision problem but you're picking up trash and that looked a little small is that is that uh is that a, the right thing or i have the wrong the wrong vision here no yeah so it's about five feet long and three feet wide you're right so like i guess the the solution to that is just add more drones if you've got a lot of trash or if you've got a giant waterway um again add more drones we could also just scale up the size of it pretty easily because it is just made of fiberglass and that just comes from a mold essentially the software is like essentially the same as long as it's going on the same speed um so yeah we could realistically scale up the size if we really wanted to and have you thought much about um i mean one of the issues with autonomous and trying to get people out of it is that you're talking about a highly complex system at the very edge of the network uh and so maintenance and support becomes a real issue you don't have engineers around uh, have you thought about how you're going to handle a broken down autonomous vehicle in the middle of a river yeah, we have thought about this a lot. And like, honestly, in the beginning, it's just going to be about like lowering our maintenance windows. So like initially, like, you know, we're probably gonna be fixing the drone like every week if something is going to go wrong. Right. But we're hoping to shrink that to like, you know, maybe once a month or maybe once every couple months or a year. And like, we, it's also got cameras on it and like we can call in remotely if it's stuck and like figure out what's wrong. So, yeah, we've, we've thought a lot about like mitigation of things going wrong. And if I could add on to that, um, our, our way of development, uh, our, say our stages of development, we're able to analyze based off of that maintenance window. So as that maintenance window closes over time and becomes smaller and smaller, that is a good indicator to ourselves that the product is, um, is becoming closer and closer to the final model. Yeah, just, just, just what, monitoring that over time. And of course, you can, you can try and pick customers that might be in clusters or something. But, right. Yeah, but I, I imagine that's going to be tough. It, it, yeah. It's... Uh, um, Water is not great for electronics as it is, right? Um, but that's, yep. that's why I guess if you solve it, you'll have maybe a competitive barrier to entry. That's great. Congrats. Thanks a lot, Nabil. Thank you so much. Excellent. Excellent questions. Um, excellent video quality. Excellent overall, Nabil. Thank you so much. Uh, next up, uh, we have uh, Luciana. Um, Luciana, now to kick things off, I'd really like you to help me with the problem I've been thinking about all morning. Ooh, which I'm is intrigued. 
How Hi. do you pronounce your last name? <laughs> it's a big problem. Um, it's Alexandru, but I have been living outside of Romania for 18 years. So I'll take uh, pretty much any pronunciation. Thank you for having me today. Of course, uh, 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 Luciana Alexandru, uh, it is a pleasure to have you. First up, we have um, Omar, um, who will be presenting Monturo. Uh, Omar is in Germany. Uh, and Monturo is kind of an interesting, I think, Back in the day, actually, Sequoia invested in a few of these companies, um, kind of mixture of, of uh, no code and, and um, live uh, data scraping. Um, and uh, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to pitch it. I'm, I'm not I'm going to do his magic. You guys are in opposing climates, according to your virtual backgrounds. So hopefully, um, you know, uh, that that works out. Um, Omar, Although, take it away. I was just going to say we're both in Europe. Hi, Omar. Very excited to hear your your pitch. Hi, Luciana. Same here. <laughs> so yeah, I'm founder of Monitoro, a no-code platform to get web data in real time, right in the tools where you need it. Today with no-code, you can store data. You can automate and integrate services. You can communicate and set up alerts. Yet to get data, you have to resort to copy-pasting or more complicated technical means. But what if you didn't have to? Let's look at a quick demo. There we go. And that's our vision, to empower professionals with real-time actionable web data, no code required. Monitoro is currently used in several use cases across industries, such as price and availability tracking for products and properties, job postings for competitor intelligence and hiring, keyword tracking in classified marketplaces, and many more. We are offering three base plans with the possibility to buy more links at any plan so that customers can grow comfortably with us. And currently we're seeing great traction and very excited users. And weekly our user activity is picking up steam. Our current milestone as a company is to reach an ARR of 600K, equating only 100 customers on our professional plan. And in fact, we only need 16,000 such customers to reach 100 million ARR as a company. So join us on, a, on our journey. Thank you. Omar, thank you. That was um, that was great. And I think there is definitely need for a product like this. I'll jump in with questions. Is that okay? Yes, please. Um, I think that uh, for you, finding the early one or two repeatable use cases will be key because the, there are so many potential use cases out there, right? So tell me, you know, you listed a few of them, but tell me a little bit about the really killer use cases that you will double down on early on. In terms of volume, uh, what we see is really like price and availability in the e-commerce space is a really a killer use case. Uh, what we thought in the beginning is that there's, you know, like there's these big players like Amazon and um, let me not name many others, but basically there are these big players. And uh, we thought that everybody wants to scrape the same websites. Turns out it's not the case. So like as we have signups, uh, we collect a lot of information from our customers, use cases that they want and so on. Uh, what we discover is that, is that there is a long tail of different websites, of different e-commerce shops that uh, are interesting for, for, these, um, for these professionals. And they want data from these companies and nobody is going to take the time to implement a specific data set for these or to, to, to implement some integration or something. We not find anything ready made for it. And um, our goal is really to, to take this uniformity in the need. So like everybody wants price and availability in this case, for example. and um, provide some flexibility to these users to, to empower them, to give them this, this superpower so that whatever this website is, you know, like uh, there is this very specific regional website that you use only in your little town, fine. You, you create a new project in Monitoro in like maybe two minutes later, you already have the data. And that's the power that we want to unleash. And who is the user within your customer and how are you going to put your tool in the hands of your user? Yes. Um, the main users that we're seeing right now are uh, mainly involved in, in the operations of the company, setting prices, deciding which suppliers to pick and so on in the specific case of price and availability. Um, 
In order to reach these users, uh, what we found the most effective is content marketing. Uh, in fact, like we, we are ranking pretty well for some keywords already. And um, we didn't even spend so much effort yet on content marketing. That was like uh, the early experiments trying to figure out what works and what doesn't. And we expect to pick up a lot of um, volume, uh, like a lot of traffic coming from this channel, as well as partnerships with uh, the likes of Airtable, IFTT, Google Sheets, and the communities that build around them. I like that you've already thought about your pricing and sometimes companies early on postpone that. Tell me how you reached this conclusion that you shared with us in terms of pricing um, yes. and why you think this is the right strategy. Right. Um, this is not the first pricing that we set for, for, um, for Monitoro. In fact, we experimented a lot. And in fact, we even had an unlimited plan at $50 per month at one point that we were willing to grandfather, but nobody picked it up at the time. Um, we experimented um, basically with, with different, um, different populations. So like there are the people who can implement a scraping infrastructure, but we thought they would not want to go through the hassle of doing that. And then there is also the other kind of people who do not, like, do not have the skill set necessarily to build this. And um, they, they are willing to, to, to go the extra mile like in terms of budget and so on to get this solution uh, in, in their hands. And we found out that there is a, a balance here that like by targeting less technical people, uh, we can provide them more value than, than the technical crowd and pricing, you know, like a lot of um, experiments with different customers, we, we, uh, like we were able to reach this, this balance point that um, right now is our current uh, offering. The one comment I would make, apparently I have time for one more question. I'll make a comment if that's okay. I think that really nailing your initial use case and making sure that's A, repeatable, B, a large market, and C, you mentioned that you're going for, for non-technical users, just make this as easy to use as possible. Those would be my, my high level comments, but I think that you're going after a very interesting space. Thank you very much, Luciana. That was great. Interestingly, uh, Omar was of course using a virtual background, I think, uh, to present from a beach, but the next person will not have a need for that. Uh, Luke uh, is up next. Luke is uh, originally from California, um, but I believe he's actually presenting from a beach. Um, so not sure what that says about him. Maybe that he's having a better life than all of us. Um, uh, Luke, uh, come up whenever you are. This is actually going to be a very fun presentation. Hello. Yeah, I'll just explain that right away. I'm in Fiji right now. Through all these weird circumstances, I ended up in Fiji. Wow. Loving life. I'm yeah. very jealous. Um, yeah, so I'm Luke. I'm the founder of Bash, a better way to throw online happy hours. So as we all know, at this point in the pandemic, socializing online sucks. And this is especially problematic for the remote workforce. But Bash makes it fun, easy, and comfortable to socialize online by combining a mix of video chatting and an online game. When you're in a Bash, it really feels like you're in a real event. And you can even customize your character to look like you. To talk to people in the game, you actually have to move close to them in the game. And if you walk too far away, it starts a new video chat with somebody else. There's party-wide music that you can listen to with the rest of the party. And there's even mini games like King's Cup or Trivia. Bash feels like a real life event so much that you even notice some weird social behavior sometimes. Like for some reason, people love to hang out in bathrooms and shy and awkward people maybe tend to hang out in the side of the room or just pair up in uh, smaller intimate conversations. But yeah, essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to gamify socializing. And we've even included games like Tag that get you walking around and talking to other people without you even thinking about it. There's a lot that we can do with this and we're really excited about it. But um, yeah, we're targeting enterprise companies and we're targeting companies that already have budgets set aside for employee bonding and events. And even though COVID may go away eventually, remote teams or at least partially remote teams will be here to stay. We can still capture some of that employee budget. As soon as the pandemic started, uh, a couple other companies popped up and then other companies started looking for solutions to this problem. However, none of these current existing solutions really fit this space of large social events. A lot of these are more tailored towards conferences or events or they're not able to fit as many people. We're still really early in our traction, but we've had paying customers and we've been doing a lot of sales demos recently. We've gotten a lot of good feedback on where we're at. And basically the feedback that we're getting is that we still need to build out a bit more products and get more games and more interactions and just more things to do in the platform. But in our long-term goals, we're trying to become a place where companies can go to and know that we can entertain their employees for about one to two hours. So we're building a healthy team finally. It was just me as a solo founder for way too long, but I finally got business development help and sales help. And I'm actually bringing on a JavaScript game developer with me as well. But we're also looking to hire a new engineer as soon as we can. So that's Bash. 
try out the demo. It's super fun. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that. I uh, I definitely have to try the product properly. Um, I looked at the, at your website before the session, and and my guess was that this is more for socializing and hanging out with friends rather than for work events. Tell me a little bit about the pieces around going to enterprises. Yeah, so that's a really big space that's been not addressed so far. Um, if you've been on a Zoom happy hour they're awful and there's really low engagement with them and companies are looking for something fun to like have their employees join basically so we're not going after conferences we're not going after those kinds of events we're going after social events where companies can basically treat their employees for a few hours and have them interact and bond and i'm just wondering how do you think about these work social events in a hopefully normalized world soon do you think they'll still take place online or do you think people will actually go for happy hour um, so I think the companies that are fully remote will still have in-person happy hours, mm -hmm. but even my team before the pandemic had remote employees on it and we had no way to bond with them. So partially remote teams at least will be still a lot more prevalent in the future and the fully remote teams to stay will still have a need for this as well. Okay. Understood. So tell me a little bit more about your ideal customer. It's, it's a remote team. If we're thinking long-term, any size sector, where are you seeing most interest? Yeah, so we're seeing interest from like the startup type company or a company that's a little bit more relaxed, anywhere from around 50 to 500 employees and more in tech for right now. But basically, yeah, a younger, also younger demographic. But yeah, it's been resonating well with older demographics as well. My one, I really like the idea. My one tip for you would be to think about expanding your use cases a little bit. Um, and I think today, every, I, I think today you should get a ton of traction, by the way. I think you should be pushing this now, right? Because it's Friday. I've worked all week. I want to have a glass of wine with my colleagues. I think, Po, you know, when we go back to normal, th there will still be remote teams. I would also think, I think the product looks really cool. I would also think about expanding your use case a little bit more. Yeah, that's good feedback. Um, yeah, we're starting with this vertical for now. And then it'll yeah. be pretty easy to expand it if we want to and build out more products. That makes sense. I th I'm going to try it. I'm going to make sure we try it at, at Sequoia. Oh, that'd be sweet. I mean, that, that's, a, that's an amazing customer right there. It's certainly one with um, the ability to pay. Um, but, um, but, but I'll leave that for you to figure out. No, I'm kidding. Luke, thank you so much. Uh, anyway, last and certainly not least, we have a very interesting presentation for you, uh, uh, Luciana, and for everyone listening in. Um, we're going to have Michael, uh, who's in San Diego, uh, present Story Creator. Now, Story Creator is... Uh, effectively Figma for video. Um, Michael, as you know, Sequoia is um, a very proud Figma shareholder. Uh, and so I think this will be kind of interesting for uh, them. I think this is a tremendous product um, that I'm going to let Michael explain. Michael, please take it away. Hey, good afternoon. Um, yeah, Hi. so I'm excited to share with you a few stories, a few user stories and a few use cases uh, with Story Creator. So let's go down, a, let's go down this journey um, of what a user would expect to get out of this product. Um, the first thing that uh, a user like uh, Mark, who is a user of the product, who is making a humorous video for his audience to basically sell his services as a virtual assistant, he would go into Story Creator and uh, he would create an account, he would log in, he would go and create a new video. And from here, he can um, basically have a tool that's like very familiar, a very easy intuitive tool to create uh, an entertaining style of video or an educational style of video. So the benefit of Story Creator, other than its intuitiveness, is the fact that there are pre-made assets like animated text, um, and it's just super easy to use. And so when Mark is done after creating his 15 second clip, he can click render, and there you go, he can sh share that on social media. So that's Mark. And um, by the way, I just wanna kind of throw this in there as a, a cool thing that Story Creator has achieved is number one product uh, of the of product hunt um, for the week. Uh, and then, so here's Antonio. Antonio is actually a customer who uses the automatic subtitling feature. And he also uses that in combination with the progress bar and the animated text. So Antonio gives tips about um, content creation and, and things of that sort. And he has 6,000 followers on uh, Instagram and he uses the tool to basically share his content and have um, all, the, all the features that he needs to be able to uh, make it accessible. And then we also have another uh, use case here for a podcaster. This guy interviews some top entrepreneurs in the space and he uses the automatic uh, visualizers. And so that's really cool. 
And then last but not least, I'm gonna show a really quick use case of me taking Mark Cuban's video and basically just chopping it up. So I have this, um, I pasted it in there and I can just trim it down. And from here, I can just take a segment of Mark Cuban's clip. I can add automatic subtitles. I can resize it. I can do a bunch of cool things and I can just click render and then share that on social media. Um, and so it just makes it bite sizeable um, the content and it's really good for the top of the funnel to get people into your uh, ecosystem. And that's Story Creator. May I go ahead with questions? Yeah, I think uh, that's pretty much all I wanted to cover. I wasn't really doc, it wasn't really scripted. It, it's just kind of, that's what it is. Um, no, but hopefully that gives you a, a good example of what the product does. I think so. And I'm just curious, do you call it Figma for video or did the team here call it Figma for, for video? I'm just curious why the parallel? Yeah. Well, so it's because you can design, um, basically it's, it's like you're taking the intuitiveness of a design tool and you're bringing that into the video world. Um, because you can do a lot of cool things with a design, with a design tool. A lot of people are familiar with Canva. Canva is another example. Yeah. Um, you can do a lot of cool things there, but uh, they're very, they're, they're static, right? You want to be able to add um, design like features, but you want to have frames. You want to be able to tell a story through a sequence of images, but you want similar tools that aren't overly complex. Um, and so that's where offering Figma like features to video is kind of the, the, the overlap. No, and I love the product, by the way. I think it's super interesting. Um, is it collaborative or is this really an individual creator? Yeah, so that's definitely where um, it doesn't actually fit into the Figma model uh, currently. But um, mm -hmm. I've actually pitched before and I've talked to Ivan from, the, he's the founder of Notion. And I've been thinking about this a lot and going in the direction of being collaborative and being the team that startup or the tool that startups use and being able to have the collaborative features where, you know, an engineer, a designer, um, somebody that uh, is a copywriter, a salesperson can all collaborate within the same organization on the same project, sharing assets, files, thoughts, comments, um, and sign offs. Um, is, is really the best way to uh, make money and, and have that defensibility and be the tool that, that, that teams use. And once you're in, it's really hard to get out. I bet you there is a lot of word of mouth. Um, tell me a bit about how people are hearing about it today. Yeah, so I've actually acquired a, a decent following on Twitter um, just through sharing my entrepreneurial journey and, and building ah, this product. Very cool. um, so that's made, like my main channel, just building an audience there. Um, I would say also word of mouth, like you said, is um, another channel. Uh, those, those are the primary channels. Um, I still have a lot of the market to tap into. Uh, that's something that I certainly need help with is the marketing and growth side of things. Um, I'm going to experiment with paid ads. I actually have a friend here in San Diego who is absolutely crushing it in the no code space, who can throw money. He throws $500 and he'll make a thousand dollars. They're already at 11K MRR. And so he's an expert. So I'm consulting with him. Um, I'm trying to learn as much as I can, but that's obviously the slow way to kind of win this game. Um, I need to kind of speed things up and I need to actually work with people and have them kind of be a part of the team and, 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 and executing and getting results. Absolutely. And I bet you, it sounds like you are seeing a lot of demand from individual creators now, but I bet you that there is similar demand within SMEs and even bigger companies with time. Um, so I would definitely think about traveling that journey and then the collaboration Absolutely. angle I think would help. I, I've had lot. some um, dealings with some agencies and I think. Yeah, exactly. Um, I was thinking agencies. Yeah. So it's almost help. there for what they need, but simple things like sharing a video link to a colleague and having them uh, gain access yeah. to the video, little things like that are yeah. super easy to code. It's just a matter of putting it on the roadmap and, and putting the focus on that persona and then just executing on that. Um, and I'm definitely kind of in that. I think camp. it's very interesting. I think it's very yeah, interesting what you're doing, opportunity, especially in the in the teams um, kind, of, kind of taking that approach. I think it's a lot of opportunity for sure. And it's a smart it's a smart business model. That's where the money is. So I think on the on the front end, it'd be for word of mouth. I would still offer like features for like the solo type, but I would go heavily and hard after the, the teams for in terms of like profitability. That makes a lot of sense. It's very interesting. I look forward to seeing what what you'll be up yeah, to. Thank for you. Sure. Sweet. Thanks. Luciano, thank you so much. That was tremendous. Uh, very much appreciated your energy and your questions uh, uh, and, 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 and your advice. As always, uh, enjoyable to have people from the Sequoia Tree uh, family here with <laughs> I us. I loved it. Um, loved good. it. Thank you. Thank you again to all of our hosts. Thank you to everyone who's watching. We're not quite done yet. Thanks for hanging out. So, so I thought, I mean, obviously, um, uh, there's so many different things we can talk about. It might be interesting for our email exchange to do a mix 
uh, of like crypto and non-crypto. You talk um, about AI, you know, that's since, since that's your one of your areas of expertise. Uh, th thank you. Yeah, maybe we can spend some time in your home court and then some time in my home court. Yeah, great. Love that you're drinking Red Bull. Um, <laughs> it's like, it's, it's actually just coffee. Oh, uh, it's, it's <laughs> the, La Colombe. It's even more than uh, <laughs> at four o'clock. That's yeah. I've started to love this stuff. That I is a highly, um, yeah, I mean, I really wish they would sponsor you. That would be, they're, they're one of my dream sponsors for myself. Actually, yeah, maybe we could start off talking about AI. Um, yeah. Obviously, we started Site Advisor, um, which is awesome. And actually, by the way, deserves a return, in my humble opinion. Um, the Google results have become quite unusable. And then you ended up uh, starting Hunch, um, yeah. which is obviously a master recommendation engine uh, uh, using machine learning and, and, and many other things where I met you originally yeah. uh, at the Hunch offices. I remember that very vividly. And, and then I got acquired by eBay, I think, in 2011. So like if we take a look at the past, maybe, I don't know, five, 10 years or so, and, you know, like a five-year-old asks me, you know, AI, I read all, my parents read these articles about AI. How is my life changing because of AI? I'm not yeah. really sure I could point to much. Um, I could point to a lot of small incremental improvements, but I can't point to anything. Well, like Siri a, and all the, I mean, those, those sorts of things are, I mean, I don't know if it's changed their lives, but certainly it's, uh, you know, it's widespread and widely used, I guess. All right. So my but, question to you, yeah. to you would be, in the next five years, it's now 2025. Um, do you think my day-to-day -day life is like significantly different? And if so, how? Yeah, I think so. And you know, I'd love your view on this. I think that we, with AI, so I don't do AI anymore professionally, but it's not because I'm not extremely bullish on it. In fact, I think, I think blockchain slash crypto and AI are the, by far the two most important things going on right now. I just happen to think AI is for a variety of reasons, probably a lot of the benefits are going to accrue to incumbents, not startups. Um, that, that's not to say there aren't tons of start startup opportunities, but anyway, I, I can talk about that more later. But I think we are, you, you tell me, but like the stuff I see like coming out of labs um, and things, it feels like there's a dam that's going to break, right? That, that, that we've only seen the beginning. And, um, you know, one, uh, my understanding is the quality of the results. So like GPT-3 and this kind of thing, right? Like it's just like the size of the models and things. That's not slowing, that's growing very quickly and it's not slowing down. So like there's sort of a Moore's law type thing going on here, which is how big is your neural network? How, you know, how much data can you put in there? And that seems to be going up at a very rapid rate. And, and as far as I know, not you maybe you'd have better insight into it, but not slowing down at all, number one. Number two, so, so the core kind of quality of the AI is getting better, right? Number two, very importantly, um, it's being packaged in a way that's accessible to uh, developers. Um, so this is everything from cloud, you know, kind of compute training services to uh, TensorFlow to all of these really nice software packages to, you know, um, uh, I think basically every, you know, client side computer now has specialized uh, chips for running, uh, uh, you know, models and deployment. Um, and so and that's very important, right? Because what you need, you need it to get to the point where it's like AWS or something like this, or just like a database where, you know, every piece of software, including an, you know, accounting software, but they don't have a big team of machine learning people is able to use the latest stuff. Right. So you tell me, but I think that, I think that it's just like, a matter of getting this stuff out to market, a matter of the models getting increasingly getting better. I think another really interesting trend, right. Is, so much of the last decade was on images, AI, you know, ImageNet, identifying what's in an image. Um, second half of the decade, really cool stuff with uh, generative images, you know, um, creating images. Now, uh, a lot of the action's moving to text, um, which just, you know, un unlocks a whole wide range of new applications. Um, so I think, I, I think it's very likely that um, I, guess, I guess a couple things. Like if you go back to the history of AI, it was it was a sort of fits and spurts, right? There were all these kind of AI summers and winters. Um, I think we're now in the the real thing. Like it's it, there's no more winters um, because of the things I was mentioning before in terms of the quality of the models and things like this, but also the economics behind it. Like there's now a business model for AI, right? Search and ads and all these. There's all these other reasons why all this money will keep keep flowing in. Whereas in the past, they were dependent on government grants and kind of the whims of, uh, you know, of those of those various funding sources. Um, so, you know, I think it's still early. Like, I mean, this all like so. So you, you mentioned like I, I got really intrigued by machine learning, I guess, back in 2007 or eight. 
we sold our company to eBay, uh, machine learning company in 2011. I thought we were at the end. <laughs> it's, so, it's so ridiculous in retrospect. I was like, I thought we were late to the game and we better sell before the AI thing. You know, of course it really began in the, the modern era, I think in 2013 with the, uh, probably the, the, the Google cat uh, video kind of experiment that came out, uh, I think was sort of considered the kind of watershed moment um, when at least, you know, the epiphany happened, people realized, I mean, I, you know, the underlying models and people have been working on that for obviously decades, but that was when people were like, oh, wow. And then if you look at the, if you look at like the image net results and all the other kind of metrics, like it just got dr dramatically better. So we're, you know, that's the other thing. We're, we're seven years into it. Like it takes a while to get these things built out, productized, deployed throughout the world. Uh, but I think it's going to happen. I think it's a major, major important area in the next couple of years. Like five years from now, I'm, I'm walking around the earth. Do you have a sense for like what's, what's going to be changed and different? Well, I think like, like the self-driving cars, like who, how, we don't know exactly how far away they are, but they're, they're going to have, I mean, it could be, it's one of these things that's so hard to predict. It could be, you know, Waymo's, I, my understanding is they're, you know, they're running in Phoenix and things, you know, with, with a safety driver and things. So still limitations and there's problems around like, you know, different lighting conditions and weather and it's not perfect yet. But, you know, it's, it's just a matter of time. I mean, matter of time, three years to 10 years or something, probably. It could be, you know, 10 years before they kind of get all the kinks out. I Maybe mean, even longer, given that it requires cultural changes, right? It requires a mindset shift to be willing to go into a car that no one's in. It requires a new system for insurance and regulatory and a whole bunch of things. So maybe it takes longer, but that, that's going to happen, right? It's going to be, you're going to have autonomous drones. You're going to have autonomous cars. You know, it's going to change transportation. It's probably going to change uh, manufacturing, agriculture, like any place you use kind of vehicles and big, heavy moving machinery. Um, that may take longer. I don't know, but you know, it all, all, anything where there's sort of physical interaction with the world will probably be mediated through some form of AI over the next coming decades. Um, you know, information work, which is what most people, most of us do now, you, know, you sit in front of a computer and you do stuff, having a, you know, a, a cyber uh, sidekick there, you know, fixing your, you know, your spell check and your grammar. And the next thing is suggesting, you know, how to finish that essay. What's the best, you know, final paragraph for the blog post. I think maybe for a while it'll be kind of this quote centaur model, you know, which is the that they call that centaurs when it was the chess players. I think for a while, there was a period in which the best chess player in the world was a human plus a computer. I think the computer alone now is the best, but I think you'll probably have an intermediate period where these people are sort of assisted by AI in a, in a whole variety of tasks. And eventually probably the AI takes over more and more of that. Um, yeah. So I think it's gonna be, you know, but I, look, I don't think it's, it's like, I think one thing that's important is like, the robots don't come looking like robots. Like it's not, you know, if, if anyone here, the, the people watching are probably too young, but there's an old TV show called the Jetsons. It was like a cartoon where, you know, it's like the future and, and, and what happened in the way that, that, you know, AI was delivered was there was literally like a butler who would go and like, you know, be a robot butler who embodied the AI and that was sort of, and they would go take the jobs. But in reality, that's not what happens. Like you don't, you don't literally take like the, you know, yeah the accountant and replace it with a robot accountant that looks like an Android. What you do is you just have really good software that is AI assisted that suddenly you're, instead of having 10 people in your accounting department, you only need two people, right? That's how it actually, that's how, that's how robots actually take over the world is like very subtly through kind of boring seeming enterprise software, yes. um, you know, so anyways. Although I do think in the Japanese uh, version of the future, it is an animatronic robot. I just well, those Honda, those Honda animatronic, or what's that? Uh, Boston, uh, uh, Boston Robotics, those scary. Uh, <laughs> very interesting <laughs> that that thing was bought, uh, just bought by Hyundai again. Um, was it? I didn't even follow it. That's, yeah. yeah it, it seems to be the, um, yeah, the tumbling pin of Silicon Valley from one company to the other. Um, okay, so that's kind of interesting. Um, we, we're talking now a lot, I guess, about digital innovation. One interesting dichotomy I've been noticing is you kind of, of course, see the a lot of the American uh, AI laboratories, you know, notably OpenAI and Google to some extent too, working on like the software stuff. Um, and of course, the holy grail here that you know everyone's you know secretly excited about is code that can write code. Um, Self-programming AI is kind of the mm -hmm. penultimate goal. Um, but what's interesting is if you look at the UK labs, it's quite different. DeepMind in particular is going very much after the material science world. Um, and I was kind of curious if you had any views on, you know, how, how like, you know, um, synthetic biology or how like the physical world might change as a result of AI as opposed to just the software world. 
Yeah, so I'm getting pretty far out of my area, but I will say, like, so, so I have a colleague, VJ Pandey, who runs our, who, who founded our bio fund. So we have a, a bio fund at Andrews and Horowitz, um, and the thesis behind our bio fund is, um, you know, why, like, our our firm is very much oriented around software, right? And traditionally, there was sort of a separation between software venture venture firms and and bio 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 investing, right? So they would do kind of molecule development and things like this, and we would do software. Our, our belief is that the two are um, kind of converging or intersecting much more, which is why we felt like the, we had the competency to create, to sort of go in, enter biology. And specifically what VJ would say is that um, because of software, machine learning, et cetera, we're now able to engineer biology instead of um, kind of going and doing, you know, trial and error and sort of a much more, if you think about how, for example, drugs are discovered. Um, it, it was in the past a much more kind of um, physical trial and error process. And today you can actually go and using software um, uh, do much more kind of engineering uh, in a much more predictable way. Um, so I think that's that again, this is I'm getting, you know, way outside of my kind of I'm not a, I'm, I'm a only a hobbyist at best with respect to biology. But my understanding is that that's like a major area in material, you mentioned material sciences. That's another important area. You know, we have a, we have a interesting company, you know, that, that does, that, that searches, uses artificial intelligence to search for um, uh, m mineral deposits as an example. Like you're just going to see, I think all sorts of interesting new applications like that. I think the probably the gating factor right now is just expertise. It's just, you, you don't have that many people yet. You will soon who, who are deep into this stuff and can go and, and work on all these different problems. Um, that 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 solves itself partly through the market, right? More it's now the most popular class at Stanford undergrad is the machine learning class, um, and it solves itself partly through tools. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and you know, you've obviously like I feel like you are consistently early to scenes that end up becoming big. Like I think you were like really the only fault one could take with Chris Dixon is that you're too early to things. I mean, you were dancing at the AI party when the club was empty and you left. <laughs> I left definitely, geez, that, that, that hits home. I definitely feel like. A, but, um, but it's amazing. Yeah. You're I've as been, a stock, I've been, I've been. you hold like you, you're always early and you were obviously early to crypto and, and, and um, it's more than made up for it. I imagine with angel investing too, I feel like you were early to a lot of trends. Um, what's the, like, how does one become early to things? How, how, how should I yeah. be? you know, adjust, how should I be I leaving the bunker? Yeah, I mean, so there's no, I mean, so this, it's actually, I think, a, a fairly straightforward. I wrote a blog post I called, um, I think it was what, what the smartest people do on the weekends, every, everyone else will be doing at work in 10 years or something like this. Um, and so the, so like, it wasn't like, I got into machine learning. It wasn't like there weren't people into it. There were a lot of really smart people into it, um, but they were, it was kind of a cult. Um, uh, and I, I find that's a that's a really um, common pattern. So what are the cults right yeah. now? Yeah. Well, I think they're all over. By the way, they're not just in technology. So like if you go back, you know, uh, my understanding is, you know, Chicago comedy in the 1970s was the genesis of like all modern kind of, you know, Saturday Night Live, whatever, a whole bunch of, you know, uh, New York film scene in the, I think it was the 80s maybe of like Scorsese. And Bob small groups are much yeah, more it's these small cultish <laughs> groups. They're often... I think it happens in academia. I think, um, you know, I, I'm not an expert in this area. I mean, I know something about like maybe historical examples, but like today I bet you there are all sorts of interesting kind of, maybe they're happening on the internet now, they used to happen physically, but they're kind of cultish groups. They tend to be people who are motivated um, because of the interestingness of the problems, not because they see any kind of payout or other kinds of things. Oh, by the way, one of my favorite examples in that is um, computer graphics in the University of Utah in the 70s. Um, you go back, there was one, I forgot, there's one rich endowment, uh, you know, uh, trustee who gave this grant to do computer graphics. And it was the only place, uh, only uh, one of the only universities in the country that took this seriously. Um, and, and if you go back, it's Adobe, Pixar, like just, you know, Atari, Apple, like everybody was there. It's a good right? way of and it was like 15 people and it, like the entire modern industry was built by that, right? Um, and it's just because somebody had, sorry, uh, machine learning, by the way, we could talk about that. These, you know, the fact that they're all Canadian, right. And they, they had these Canadian grants and like, it would just happen to be it. for whatever. Yeah. Jeff Hinton is the patriarch. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, or one of the patriarchs. And, yeah. and you think about like, why were they working on, like, just going back to, to neural nets, like why were they working on neural nets right. in the nineties right. and two thousands? Right. I mean, it was pretty eccentric to do it then. 
And it was really, that they had this view that, um, that that's how the brain works from what we know, you know, it has sort of a neural network structure and therefore this should eventually work. But that was very hard to get to stay excited by that in, in those decades when the results just weren't good, right? Yeah. Um, like when we did hunch, like that was just neural nets just didn't work. Um, it, it turned out, it turned out you just needed more GPU power and all those other things. They eventually worked, but, but at the time, like the results just were very poor. Right. And yet they, they, they continued. Even at us for, for Q in 2013. Um, yeah. and this is after the famous Hinton paper, which, you know, uh, ultimately led to that cat situation with Google that you're talking about. Um, it was still believed. I mean, we'd sold to Apple and we were like working on machine learning on Apple's budget. And it was still kind of believed that like, yeah, I mean, this stuff's super dumb. Um, maybe it can do c cool toy examples, but it doesn't really work. But but I love this idea of, of kind of um, passion cults, uh, uh, you know, of uh, are, are the stories often of what creates future yeah. technology. Look, by the way, home, Homebrew Computer Club. Homebrew, exactly. Uh, Unix, open source software, like cult. all these things were weird cultish clubs. That, Every that person listening to this is only wondering, what are the cults right now? Yeah, I mean, so uh, be a pioneer. Um, awesome. Good stuff. Thank you so much for the time. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. I just wanted to show you a couple of um, cool, quick things. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, share my screen. Now, you may notice um, I don't have a hat um, on my head right now, and my face is a little bit uh, sunburned. So um, the first interesting thing that, you know, that I'm going to do is, is buy myself a hat. Um, we do sell these Pioneer hats. So um, they're pretty nifty, as you can see from the person here. Um, they tend to make you happy. They're available in all sizes. They're, they have a three and an eighth inch crown. I don't know what that means, but I assume you want it. Um, anyway, check it out. It's always nice to, um, to have hats and we sell them now. Um, I don't know what that says about us, but um, you can definitely let us know. Um, it's very easy. You can use Google Pay if you don't support, uh, want to support Stripe. Don't have to reveal my credit card number to everyone. Okay, moving on. Uh, I actually wanna show you something pretty awesome, um, which is uh, a new product we're gonna launch. It's called a, a Pine, the Pioneer Launcher. We're gonna launch the launcher, a trebuchet, launching a trebuchet. But anyway, the gist is this. Um, the gist is, you're all probably staring at the screen now, but I'll try to make this as engaging as possible before I click here. Um, all of you, I think spend a lot of time giving very similar uh, advice to startups that's kind of repeated over and over and over again. And the story of the launcher is really to try to take the essence of that advice and put it into software. Because I mean, hopefully that makes sense to folks it, to take the essence of that advice and put it into software, almost build a curriculum out of it such that you don't have to say the same things over and over to startups. You could kind of point them at a thing that will just orient their mind in the right way. You end up playing a game that teaches you about life as opposed to reading books about it. And so uh, if you click get started, you, you're thrown to, uh, to this page um, uh, where we kind of just ask you, um, you know, you imagine you're a prospective person working on a project and we ask that you uh, when you'd like to launch. Um, uh, because of course we know the most important thing startups don't want to do uh, is, um, well, is, is launch. Uh, and, you know, artists often don't want to show their work. Um, so this is kind of a nifty, um, uh, a nifty little UI. And of course, we've, we've done a lot of cute things to, to, to try to nudge people in the right direction. Um, you know, if you set a launch date that's a bit too far out, then, um, well, we, we kind of go clippy on you. So um, anyway, let's imagine you pick a launch date. Let's say you're working on a project and you're like, okay, I think I can get this out, you know, a month from now. You can advance to kind of the next level. See here, it's nicely structured. We ask you to describe it. Obviously, um, you know, you can say I am uh, working on building an online city for, um, you know, uh, creative outsiders that want to make a company out of their passion project. Okay, that seems good. And then you can you can kind of click here if you're launched or pre-launch, um, should kind of guide you in the right direction. Let's imagine here I'm pre-launch and then you kind of move on to the next level. And this is kind of neat, by the way, yours truly is seeing this particular UI for the first time uh, with you. So that's awesome. We're literally just kind of building this last minute. Um, of course, the, you know, the, the second thing startups don't do is they don't talk to their customers enough. Um, uh, they, they kind of really all like writing code more. And so we're kind of trying to encourage here in the launcher, this part of the game here, part of the element is to, is to send your first email to users. So that's kind of the next step in the curriculum. 
Um, this is really trying to put like, you know, the, the Harvard uh, into software. Um, and so we kind of write the email for you. Um, you know, uh, I'm sure all of you give advice that, you know, gosh, you, you write your uh, write shorter emails to startups, whatever. Stop preaching and get people to start using the software so that you can spend less time kind of um, eating up oxygen saying the same things. We literally, you know, you use this template. And so you could say, you know, um, I think we uh, very cleverly injected here. Um, what I was saying previously, obviously it's, you know, it's not perfect. Um, uh, you know, uh, I can do this quickly, idiot here. Um, you know, I think I'll tell you, you'd find it interesting. And you know, a lot of time I'm wondering, you know, who would my first user be? And so maybe I'm thinking of me, you know, emailing a potential founder. So, you know, because you're working on, um, you know, YouTube DL, you kind of get the idea. Your next goal in this game will be to, of course, email uh, that person. Um, and so um, we'll kind of try, try to keep you accountable here. You know, just like Strava, keeping you accountable on the tracking the mile that you run. Um, we try to make sure you, you of course, send the, the proper email, right? Uh, and so we'll keep tabs on when you email that person. Uh, and when you do, we'll kind of flag it for you. Um, and then, you know, we're trying to keep things simple and interesting, right? So we start off just email one user and and then you kind of get to advance to the next level. You see, by the way, here, I don't know if you notice, there's a nice little progress bar. I would really love to get milliseconds in this progress bar if the team will let me, but that's a different conversation. So let's imagine you emailed one user, right? Step by step. Now you're kind of, your next step is to email 10 users. Uh, and we again, we try to like really make it fun and interesting and dynamic um, for people. For every user you email, it will of course show up here. I'm not gonna bother all of you with me doing this live now, but you kind of get the idea as long as you BCC this uh, email address, it'll show up here and you kind of get a real sense of achievement and accomplishment, a sense of mastery and agency um, as you go about kind of launching your thing. Anyway, so that's kind of the cool thing we're doing. Um, it's not really ready to be launched itself. Um, ironically, um, we could probably use our own product here um, but you kind of get the idea of, 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 of what it is. Um, so um, you can check it out um, here on this link, pioneer.app slash launcher. Um, and uh, basically the reason we're presenting this uh, to you guys, because um, you know, much of the audience today, I mean, if you're, you're, if you're kind of working on a project and you want to give it a go, please do and send us feedback. Um, but obviously if you're an investor, um, um, you know, you can't quite put your LPA into this, right? So um, we really just are, would love to get feedback from you and how to make it better. And we would love to work with folks that, um, you know, that, that, that are speaking to founders every day that are finding themselves kind of writing the same, you know, email over and over um, to make this kind of a convenient tool for you almost um, so that, uh, you know, so that you can kind of convince people to, uh, start companies. Um, uh, you know, we're kind of on the spiritual mission here uh, at Pioneer to really generate more startups. I, I, I hope we're more than just an accelerator. I hope we are a generator. We're really doing this because we think there could and there should be more companies. You know, the world today is really stuck in one, a universe where like tech is really run by like five or six companies. Um, and I really think we could and should be doing better and different. I, like, I don't believe that there's a fundamental constriction on the number of great deals that happen every year. Every year so far, as far as I can tell, there are like five venture deals that matter. I really think we could stand to have 50. Um, and the main constriction on the system is people self-editing themselves from starting more companies. So we wanna get people to do that. Um, I, I, I think we could just, the, there is an alien universe that has 10,000, 100,000 great companies started every year. It is completely possible. Um, but anyway, please check it out and send us feedback to me, team at pioneer.app, whatever. Um, and, and if you think it's really great, um, I guess you can start sending folks to it. But I suspect you'll have some suggestions for us. So please let us know what they are. Um, excellent. Now, all of that said and done, I, I would like to um, just let you know, thank you for casting all of your votes um, in terms of kind of who won today. Uh, very interesting. The data is not exactly what I expected. So in, um, it's very exciting, actually. Uh, in third place, we have Autobahn.ai. It's kind of a mixed uh, between, um, you know, Uber Freight and, 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 and SaaS service to trucking providers. Oh, interesting. We're having, 
much like the U.S. elections, it seems like the results are inconclusive. Please hold. Well, I'm now stuck in an interesting situation. I'm caught in a bit of a, uh, a thermal corner, uh, to quote Craig Federici. Um, I, it's, it's unclear to us uh, as of now, um, <clears throat> it's unclear to us whether autobahn.ai, which I just mentioned, is in third place or prefix uh, is in third place. Um, either way, um, you know, in the spirit of platform nine and three quarters, we can consider them both in third place. In second place, uh, we have a sales cabal. Sales cabal is building Shopify for Africa. Um, uh, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, it's obviously a giant market, the continent sized market. Um, there aren't many of those left. Uh, and in first place, we have Money Pool, um, who's building um, a kind of way of, uh, you know, pulling uh, money together, focused on Latin America, kind of Venmo for Latin America. Anyway, so that's pretty exciting. Um, I would like to thank everyone for listening and watching. Hopefully this was invigorating to you. This was fun. This is a great way to spend a you know morning, afternoon, evening, depending on where you are. I would really like to thank our hosts um, for, for taking the time, um, sharing their acumen with us, um, to our presenters, and um, most importantly, uh, to the team at Pioneer uh, that uh, has built all of the great um, software and um, just like, you know, sung the song uh, that is this uh, presentation. Um, you know, everyone from um, Jackson to Rishi to James to Santiago um, to who am I missing? Sam um, to the other Sam. Anyway, thank you guys. Uh, you're really the reason this works. I'm, I'm just here to present everyone. And, uh, you know, um, I took down the website yesterday. So that really seems to be my other job. Anyway, thank you again um, for taking the time to tune in. Uh, we'll be back soon with more. Hopefully, please do send us more broad feedback if you have it. Um, we're very much thirsty for it. Thank you all, and I hope you have a great day.